Good morning, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome back. I know some people were here quite late last night. All right, so uh, we've got a great day of programming. Thrilled to, uh, to have this special session of Windows on Israel with our guest Jeffrey Goldberg, who I'll introduce in just a second. But uh, Jeff and I were speaking uh, for just a moment. I was telling him what we do here. And uh, essentially, uh, once a month, or once, well, let's say once a month, we gather uh, for a very informal conversation about Israel. Oftentimes we have guests, sometimes we're just looking at uh, elections, um, but I, I pride this in being a place where uh, a variety of opinions are respected and open conversation happens, and uh, respectfully, and I'm um, hoping, and I, I trust that, of course, of course, uh, I trust that uh, we, have, we have a hard stop at 945, so we're going to, we're going to forego uh, the usual format of a speaker going for about 20 minutes and then opening it for questions, and I'm going to just ask Jeff a couple questions and then we'll open it up. Does that sound good? All right, so let me introduce our guest, Jeffrey Goldberg. He's, uh, uh, his book, Prisoners, has been hailed by one of, the, uh, one of the year's best books by the LA Times when it came out. Uh, I suggest you read a fascinating account. When, when you worked as a, in, a, in an Israeli prison, right? And then the subsequent relationship you had uh, with a particular prisoner that, that extended uh, well past that experience, uh, well published, uh, now the Washington correspondent of the New Yorker, the recipient of the 2003 national. That, that this is, I, I thought so. Yeah, I thought yeah, I was yeah. reading an old That's bio. An so bio. let me just introduce yeah. you with what yeah. I, listen, <laughs> if you follow, <laughs> if you follow Israeli-American Jewish relations and you, uh, then you are reading Jeff Goldberg, okay? Whether it's in The Atlantic, whether it's in Bloomberg News, uh, I think that you will not read a more honest and uh, a more penetrating analysis of, uh, of what's happening in, in, in the world uh, between Israel and America, politics in general. Uh, you've, inter you've interviewed President Obama how many times? Uh, a number of times. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but uh, just thrilled, Jeff, that you're here. And, uh, and especially for me personally to be able to, to have this uh, more intimate dialogue than what we'll be having later on, I think is a great uh, privilege for all of us. So welcome. Thank you. I think that was better than your formal bio. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, thank you. So let's jump right in because uh, if you've been reading any newspapers in the last few weeks, you've been, uh, you've been following this situation uh, where the uh, American ambassador sort of, uh, in, a, in a speech, challenges the Israeli government about the settlements. And um, it's actually more than just the ambassador, Dan Shapiro. I'm receiving emails from colleagues uh, 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 requiring more transparency and funding that goes over the green line, this, this, this idea of the settlements. And, uh, uh, Roger Cohen writes an op-ed the other day in the New York Times calling for uh, labeling and uh, closing the loop on tax incentives for donating. Uh, so you, in a previous article, I just want to read what you wrote, and I'm going to slightly uh, edit it and, and allow you to finish the sentence, because this question of, of settlements is a big one. And uh, I, want, I want to begin with just uh, opening it up to, since this is really what's what's happening in the Times, uh, for you to give us a little commentary on your thoughts. You write uh, in an article uh, from 2015, unlike Obama, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking this out of context to understand. I feel like it's like meet the press, you know. And, Go ahead. Okay. Unlike Obama, several of his predecessors and most American diplomats who specialize in the Middle East, I no longer believe that a reversal of the settlement project would necessarily set in motion a process that culminates in the conflict's end. The 100-year-old conflict between Arab and Jew was not initiated by the 48-year-old occupation of the West Bank, as the latest round of Palestinian terrorism directed Israel suggests. The conflict is about something more than settlements. For many Palestinians, and certainly for many Palestinian leaders, Israel is an illegitimate state, and the Jews are not a people. There will be no permanent end of the conflict until Palestinians bring their understandings of Jewish history into line with reality. I'm going to stop there. You then, there, there's a but, okay? Um, a big but. There's a big as but. And I'd like you to just to address this but as we, as we read the comments of the ambassadors, as we think about transparency and funding, as we think about the role that settlement plays, settlements play in this conflict, if it's not the root cause of the conflict, then what is it? Right. Well, so the, the but 
is, is, and this is a philosophical thought, I guess, uh, is that Zionism has always been about Jewish agency, Jewish autonomy, that Jews are taking control of their own destiny. You know, the, the, the line is always, uh, for 2,000 years, Jews were outside of history. They were acted upon by history, but they did not control their own history. Uh, so my point is that it doesn't matter what the Palestinians believe or don't believe about the Jews. If you allow the Palestinian narrative to dictate your behavior, then you have been hijacked. Um, it's another kind of Palestinian hijacking, I guess. Um, the, you are not taking control of your destiny. You are excusing your behavior by saying it doesn't matter what I do, and my argument is that despite that, and we have to deal with that reality, the reality is that I think uh, proportionally speaking, more Israelis have come to understand that the Palestinians uh, have a need for a state in their ancestral homeland than Palestinians believe that Jews need a state in their ancestral homeland. But if we wait for Palestinians to evolve to that, the Israel that we know and admire will be gone. And the Israel that we know and admire, let me, I can't speak for everybody here, but I'll speak for myself, is one that is both a Jewish majority haven, one place where Jews can be in the majority, can, can organize their own lives according to their desires, uh, and obviously serve as a, as a lifeboat for other Jews who need it. Uh, but it's also a democracy in which the rights of minorities are, are respected, uh, in which uh, everyone has a say. It's very unusual in the Middle East, obviously. It's one of Israel's greatest attributes. Um, and so what's happened, well, two things have happened. One is that the, the Zionist right, if you will, the Israeli right, has defined for the world, or defined for the Jewish world, what pro-Israelism means. And they say, if you criticize the settlements, that means you're opposed to Israel. And, 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 and it's obvious if you're, if you're in that movement politically, you're gonna want to do that because you're gonna to wanna to shut down criticism of your particular branch of, of Zionism. Um, so you know, they, they, they've done that, and the, the second thing that they do is they, they take this, to me, almost anti-Zionist fatalistic approach, which is like, it doesn't matter what we do because no one will like us anyway, so let's just do whatever we want. <clears throat> and in that case, <clears throat> excuse me, they're not, they're not privileging what I think of as classical Zionist ideas, uh, which is, you know, which is, doesn't overly fetishize the possession of all the land of Israel, which, which raises democracy as a value, and which says, which says it's in our hands. They, they basically said, until the Arabs change, we can't control this, so we're just gonna keep doing what we're doing. In the meantime, they're gonna lose the Jewish day. Right, and in addition, you-, you Not write, that I have an opinion about this. Right? <laughs> we're, we're, we brought you here for your opinion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in addition, there's issues you write in another essay about uh, just in the world stage, right? What this does to our friends, right? Whether whether Israel's right or not to expand settlements, yeah. or or whether settlements are the root cause. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the title of your article in Bloomberg, but there was it was something about you know sacrificing our friends for the sake of settlements. So it's right. not just about autonomy. It's not just about self determination. It's right. also about the relationship that we have and how that's affecting right. you know, allies in the world. Right. Well, so I have this, made this observation that um, Jews, especially Jews who are in charge of Israel right now, tend to think we're bigger than we are. I mean, that, that our, our numbers are actually bigger than, than they are and that we have the throw weight of China. You know, China can eat Tibet for breakfast and no one cares because China can create its own weather system. So China's a billion and a half people. They can do whatever they want. The Jewish, by the way, I, I had one of my, one of my worst ideas ever um, was that I, 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 I wanna, I, I'd love to propose that the Jews and the Chinese enter into a formal alliance because together we're 1.5 billion people <laughs> and we could really then we dominate, could then the we world. control yeah. the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's all we just, over. We just, we just, we just should, um, we just should get through a formal uh, arrangement with the Chinese. Um, so, so, you know, and this is a very, I haven't fully formulated this to myself, but there's, a, there's something very Jewish about uh, the obstinacy of saying, yes, but the world is wrong. 
you know, because we're, 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 we're interested in system change. We're interested in absolute morality. This is, this is, these are bred into our, into our right. theological system, right? So we look and we say, but everybody's wrong. Um, you, they're wrong to blame us for the faults, of the, the problems of the Middle East. They're wrong to blame us for the, the lack of a Palestinian state. I agree. It doesn't matter. Like at a certain point, go back to the founders of Israel. David Ben-Gurion, one of the most practical men alive. If he were alive today and would be looking at what the Israeli government would be doing, he'd say, well, that's counterproductive because you made enemies. And we're a state now. And so a state has to figure out ways to mitigate the damage of its policies. And so uh, in any case, the world is predisposed against Jews because we're Jews. I mean, let's not kid ourselves about, about the unchanging realities of, of this planet, right? Uh, so when you're Benjamin Netanyahu, you say, Europe's going to boycott us. We're going to boycott Europe. <laughs> and Europe says, fine, you know, <laughs> because it's eight million people. And, and so, and so and people get upset when I say this in, in Jewish audiences because they want to stand for truth, justice, and the Jewish way. And I said, that's fine within, within certain parameters, but you're just going to lose the fight. So you might as well not go lose the fight. So let, let's stay on Netanyahu for one second, then we'll open it up for questions. Um, another uh, article you wrote in a really beautiful passage. You're scaring me that you read this stuff. Uh, <laughs> what else do I do? Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know. It's a small synagogue. <laughs> so you write beautifully about, you brought up Ben Gori and the sort of, uh, you know, Mount Rushmore of Israeli leaders and, yeah. and the, 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 you know, Herzl, Ben Gurion, and, and the third one will be the one who, who sort of brings about the, the yeah. stability and, and the peace. And, and, and you, you talk about Netanyahu as the potential for that third person. And um, you may have changed since then, but, but, but I'm curious, what, what has to happen? We all follow Bibi. We know, we know what's going on, you know, to, to the degree that we know. What, what would Bibi need to do in this situation to sort of cement his place in that, in that Rushmore of, of, yeah. of, of Jewish Israeli leaders who have established not just the idea, not right. just the reality, right. but the permanence of the so state. So the formula, and I, and I use the term pantheon, because right. I'm more polytheistic than you are, obviously. <laughs> um, but, but I use the, the idea of the pantheon, that there are three seats in the Correct. Zionist pantheon, if you will. There's Herzl, who, who dreamt up the idea of a political Zionism as opposed to spiritual Zionism, which always existed, obviously. Um, uh, there's Ben Gurion who made that vision concrete, right? And then the third seat was the one who ensured Israel's permanent place under the sun, right? That it, it, I mean, Israel is a country without borders for 68 years, 60. Well, I don't know how I can't do math. Um, almost 70 years in Israel it doesn't even have borders yet that, that people recognize. And, and so that seat is for the person who actually develops normalization with the rest of the world. And that was going to be, obviously, it was supposed to be Rabin, right? right? But we, we see the power of an assassin to change the course of history. It was going to be Sharon, but he had a stroke. I mean, as unlikely as that sounds, it was going to be Sharon. Um, and so it's up to Bibi. And so let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me reverse this just for a moment and sort of explain how I think Obama understands this. Now, this is a controversial view in certain quarters of the Jewish community because People think he's, uh, you know, some kind of Mengele or something right. in certain quarters of Brooklyn. Um, uh, not on the enlightened Upper East Side, obviously. But, uh, but his frustration, you're talking about Dan Shapiro, the ambassador, I'll come back to that in a minute. But his frustration is that he understands this formula the way I understand this formula. He understands, because he understands politics. And he looks at Bibi, who's a very hard-edged guy, comes out of a certain unforgiving tradition of Zionist thought, right? He's a Jabotinskyite. Um, he knows, Obama knows, that a left winger in Israel, one of the people who might fit in more smoothly into New York Jewish politics or Manhattan Jewish politics, is not gonna deliver Israel, the Israeli public, which is very suspicious for good reason, of the Palestinians, of peace, of compromise, of territorial compromise eventually. Uh, they're not gonna be the ones who deliver 70 or 80% of the Israeli public. Only Bibi, right now, on the scene, can deliver 70% of the Israeli public to a difficult deal. And so what Obama thinks to himself is, is if this guy just had the vision or the courage to understand that, then he would get off his tuchus and try this. The difference between Obama and, and, and Bibi 
is that Bibi seems to be arguing that the status quo is sustainable for Israel. And Obama and a lot of people from the center to the left in Israel believe that the status quo is not sustainable. Um, what would it take to get Netanyahu to move? I don't think there is anything anymore. I, I, I'm, you know, he, so Joe Biden went to Israel a few years ago and Biden being Biden said the following to Netanyahu, which actually Netanyahu found this charming. He said to him, you know, my father, because his father had a thousand and two sayings, right, by his father. My father once said that, you know, don't crucify yourself on a small cross. Because what the Vice President of the United States says to the Jewish Prime Minister of the State of Israel in Jerusalem, don't crucify yourself on a small cross. It translated well. You know, no, no, but it tra it's local. Yeah, it's, a local exactly. it's a local analogy. Uh, and, and Bibi was charmed by this, and he understood the point. It's like, if you're going to go for it, then just go for it. You know, risk everything, risk your political career, risk the party, risk what, to go for it. And there was this hope with Kerry, with, with Biden to some degree, that BB would go for the big cross, right? right. Um, and I don't know a lot of people anymore who think that, think, uh, BB is a hunker down kind of guy. There's a, you know, you build yourself a bunker and you stay in it and you hope that the storm passes, but, but I don't know if the storm is, is passing. And so the, the real question is, What's the, what's the fail-safe point? What is the, what is the point beyond which it's too late to arrange for the eventual emergence of a two-state solution? I don't think a two-state solution is coming tomorrow because the entire Middle East is falling apart, but you have to create conditions for that two-state. Um, we might be five years past that. We might be 20 years past I don't know. Or we, it might be not for five years, but we don't, we don't know. And right now you have a prime minister who is not thinking about cre creative ways to, to bring about the eventual separation, because that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about anything romantic here. We're talking about bring about an orderly divorce between Palestinians and Jews so they can go do their own thing for a while. It feels like we're moving more in the direction of settlement rather than occupation, which has a different I, feel. I, I've always argued that settlements are not the late 20th century or the 21st century uh, version of Zionist pioneering. I believe that they're the, the spearhead of the, bi, of the binational state. Which of course is an impossibility for reasons we can go into if you want. Um, by entangling Israelis in the lives of Palestinians who don't want to be entangled, um, eventually what's going to happen, and it's happening now um, in Europe, it's happening now on campuses, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, what's happening is that people are saying, fine, you know, you, you're, you're all mixed in together, uh, but some of you have the vote and some of you don't have the vote. And so what, what are you going to do? And this is where it becomes very, very difficult question for American Jews because we believe in, we as a general proposition, believe in a couple of different things. We believe in Israel and we believe in democracy. Right, and there's this tension, then we'll open up the questions. There's this tension when we hear the ambassador say there are two forms of justice in the, in the, in the West Bank. There's, you know. It's true. It, it's true, and yet we don't want to hear, part of us doesn't want to hear that. Part of us doesn't want to hear that the settlements are the cause of this, uh, this whole mess. And, Settlements are not the cause of the mess. The, the reversal of the settlement process right. would be a partial solution Correct. to get out of, out of the mess. Correct. That's okay. the way I would Okay, thank it. you. Let's, uh, we've got plenty of time for questions. Let's open it up. Remember, uh, I see, don't worry. Okay, um, you'll be the first one. But let, let's just remember that, uh, as we like to say, questions end with a question mark. We're not looking for political statements here. Not, not Jewish questions. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we've got a great opportunity here. So let's, uh, let's take some time and, uh, and ask Jeff some questions. Stanley, yeah, go ahead. We have mics, so just hold on one second. They're gonna, gonna come around with mics. Last night, the ambassador gave what I thought, toward the end anyway, was a very positive uh, talk about Israel and its future. And I'm looking back at uh, the way the college campuses in the United States were a generation ago, the way they are now, and who the kids on the campuses now are going to be in Congress in the future. Yeah. And what's happening with Europe and Israel and what happened with France and Israel. And I'm afraid of what could happen with the United States and Israel. And I wonder if you could talk a little more <laughs> if it looks positive to you as it does to the ambassador. 
Um, I'll be talking about that for approximately 34 minutes at 11.30. So, uh, or 78, I don't know, sometimes I get carried away. It goes and, long uh, yeah, I don't want to cut I'll into- listen to you all ne day. Never cut into the kiddish. I that's all I- You are fighting a soon <laughs> Look, look I, 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 I know the rules, but uh, the, uh, I'm not, no, I'm not. I mean, Dennis and I talk about this all the time. Um, and, you know, I'll say, I'll say this, he's not here, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> Lindsey Graham has this saying about John Kerry, which is that um, if you ran John Kerry over, um, burned down his house, and shot his dog, Kerry would put you down as undecided. Um, and um, I think this applies in a way. I, I, there's, there, the, you know, De Dennis, by virtue of what he does for a living, believes there's always a solution, and that and that everything is manageable and that you, you're, you know, no matter how bad it seems, it's not really that bad. And I'm, you know, and this is just a disposition question. I, I might just be more of a pessimist than, than he is. Um, and, you know, he's also analyzing it from a government to government uh, perspective. And, you know, on, right now on a government to government level, despite all of the, uh, you know, tumult in the Netanyahu-Obama relationship, the relationship is still, fairly extraordinary on a government to government level, but I think you're right. I think that, that um, uh, this is the way I always put it, um, and I'm happy to have this argument with whoever wants to have this argument, but I believe that Barack Obama is a, basically a liberal Zionist, a left-wing Zionist. I've had enough conver hours of conversations with him about this uh, to know where he is philosophically. He believes in the basic justice and necessity of the state of Israel. But, Think about this for one second. Think about the 20-year-old Barack Obama who's an international relations major at Columbia right now. This Barack Obama is 54, the one in the White House, and he has some experience with the world, and he, he understands what the, what the Holocaust was, he understands the history of anti-Semitism, he understands the impulse for a Jewish state. The biracial or multiracial, third world oriented, very, very smart international relations major at Columbia right now, I would almost guarantee you doesn't like Israel. Whether he's involved in the BDS movement or not, I don't know, but doesn't like it. Sees it as a retrograde kind of state, sees it as a discriminatory state, um, doesn't understand why the United States would support this. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. I mean, am I positive about Israel? Yeah, I'm positive about Israel. Israel's an amazing place. One of the things, one of the things that this issue does is that it obscures all of the rest of Israel. You know, like we, we should be talking about Israeli scientific achievement or uh, it, you know, its achievements in, in water reclamation, the arts, the rebirth of Hebrew literature. We should be talking about all of these things, right? But we don't, we never talk about these things. We talk about settlements, right? So, so I, I, I'm not, I don't, I, I don't feel very good about, about where this is headed if it keeps moving in the same kind of thoughtless direction. It's going, I think your point is actually uh, I, I, I didn't. I never phrased it to myself in this way, but I think you're right. The, the, you know, the kids right now at Wesleyan and Oberlin and Berkeley and UCLA um, are going to be in Congress in 20 years. And 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 but the, but I'll very quickly just 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 turn that turn that one more notch and say that the Jewish kids on these campuses who are imbibing this kind of hostility are going to be the ones who APAC today is gonna to have to count on 20 years from now to do the lobbying for Israel, and I don't think they're gonna be doing it. Not the non-Orthodox majority. It, it, yeah, except that you know, organizations like that are, are making very pointed efforts to, to engage not just the liberal Jewish community, but you know, for example, if you go down to a policy conference, you'll see a whole Christian coalition of people who are you know, yeah. your point's well taken, but clearly, yeah. I, I clearly don't see, I, I, I was just up at Yale, I don't see a huge evangelical presence. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't see a huge evangelical presence on the campuses that send people to Congress and the State Department and the Pentagon and the White House. But I, I you know, I mean. You, I, I'm gonna hold on to my optimism. You know, no, 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 I mean, you, you, everything's changeable. Right. So I, I just don't feel like, right. and, and, and I feel like we're in this period of stagnation and it's, and it's a, dimin and, and, and it's, and it's a, it's a diminishing kind of proposition. Yes. No. Oh, go ahead. We got plenty of time. 
So this may be a very um, naive question, um, and it's one I don't feel comfortable bringing up on Twitter where I'm constantly writing to Jeffrey. <laughs> but um, it's the term occupation itself that I find hard to deal with because when we bring it up here, we're speaking about the West Bank, right? Um, but of course, there are those who consider all of Israel occupied. Right. My own point of reference, you know, growing up and studying, my, my studies were about World War II France. So when I think of occupation, I think of something that's truly imposed by the, an external power, the German occupation of France. Admittedly, I was born a couple of years after the Six Day War, but it seems to me that this was not a, or it is not, you know, the, the conventional concept of an occupation, right? I mean, it, it, the idea that East Jerusalem also is occupied. Right. There were wars imposed on Israel, right. which Israel defended, and then there are results of wars. I mean, how do we, how do we understand the concept of occupation and how it should be resolved, and at the same time, point out to people when they're, they're wrong about other people in their sort of charges of right. occupant colonizer and so right. forth. Well, I don't, um, I'm not comfortable with the term occupation either, and I don't think that occupation is the most salient issue. Occupation, I mean, the occupation of the West Bank can be justified for defensive purposes. It's the settlement that becomes the more problematic area. When you start moving your own citizens into the occupied land that you're temporarily, it's still temporary occupation, right? The land that you're still occupying. If you start moving your own citizens and applying your civil legal code to those citizens, but the people next door who happen to be Arabs who are under occupation, live under military rule, that's where it becomes a devastating thing. And one of the things when I get into arguments with people to the right of me on this, they say, well, you can't end the occupation because you can't give up the hills that surround Ben Gurion Airport because they'll, ISIS will come and fire rock. I agree. Nobody's giving up the hills right now. You know, nobody's giving up the hills, but what, 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 what I think the signal that needs to be sent is we're not interested in permanently holding on to this land. We're not interested in permanently holding on to people who don't want to be held on to, right? Um, but you raise a whole other, I mean, you raise several questions in your question. Uh, and, I, and I think one of, the, one of the tragedies is that they're, they're of the situation is that there's not enough education going on. I, I'm not even worried about the non-Jewish world anymore. I'm worried about within the Jewish world. Uh, where, and I'll talk about this in a little while, but, but where you, you hear Jews speak out of ignorance on it. Like, well, why is there an occupation? Why do the Jews have a right to quote unquote Palestine? Which of course was a word invented by the Romans to erase the Jewish presence in the land of Israel. Uh, you know, and, and you have people who are questioning the basic suppositions, uh, the, the, the sort of the consensus that we mainly have in this room. Uh, and so I think there needs to be a huge effort. I'm not, here's where I'm not fatalistic. I think you can have a huge effort to explain the basic justice of the Zionist cause, right? Um, and go out and talk about and talk about why there's an occupation. You know, when when uh, this is one of the unfortunate things in my profession and 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 on, on campuses is that history always seems to start when Israel has done something aggressive, quote unquote. It's never you know, and you even see this in the headlines in these latest stabbings. It's like you know, uh, Israeli soldiers kill two Palestinians on Jerusalem Street. It's like you know, the third paragraph mentions that those two Palestinians have to be stabbing people at the time. Um, you know, and, and so it, these, are, these are the structural unfairnesses of being Jewish, and I can't fix that. But what I, what I can fix is, 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 uh, is the arguments for the underlying justice of the cause. And I think one of the tragedies of the settlements in particular is that they obscure the justice uh, of the cause. Um, I don't know if that's, that's only a partial answer to your question, but it's the best I got before coffee. <laughs> All right. And nobody from this side of the room has a question? Because we'll keep going on this. I see, Barry. Go ahead. Like an invisible pizza between the question and the maybe they have Thanks, Neil. I want to pick up on Stanley's question on uh, BDS and take a different angle on it. Last night, uh, Ambassador Ross made, I think, a, to, to me, a cogent argument that the the less daylight, the more secure Israel feels, the more it's willing to take risk, the more the United States can help mitigate that risk, then maybe that might move it. To me, the BDS movement actually creates. Uh, more insecurity for Israel. So where do you think this is going? Do you think that 
the BDS movement will, uh, by opening up more daylight, creating more risk for it in the minds of Israelis, make them more intransigent? Or do you think it'll tip to a point where Israel will say, we can't win this, we have to do something? I mean, I, I think you're, you're slightly misinterpreting the goal of the BDS. The BDS movement is an anti-Semitic movement designed to destroy Israel. So, so they are, they are, uh, no, I, 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 I'm, uh, you know, I'm 100% sure uh, of this. Believe me, I spent a lot of time reading what they do. And, and they're very clever in the way they organize their arguments, obviously. Um, anybody who argues for binationalism in the Middle East now is either a, 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 a fool um, or completely duplicitous. So anyway, I have very strong feelings about the BDS, as you can tell. Um, but to, to Dennis's point, it's, it's a fascinating point. And, and so, so Obama comes into office after eight years of no daylight and decides that, well, that didn't work, even though it partially did. I mean, Sharon did pull out of Gaza unilaterally. It wasn't executed well, but he did do what the Palestinians wanted, right? Uh, but he comes in thinking, all right, we haven't made any progress toward an actual Palestinian state, and there was no daylight, so I'm going to try a little bit of daylight and see what happens. Um, we're going to have every, every presidency as a reaction to the previous presidency, so the next presidency, whether it's Hillary or whatever, um, I mean, I, you know what, you can't even talk about this election as, in a regular way. You can't even assume that somebody's going to have a normal reaction to events. Uh, uh, they're going to probably have less daylight. And, and I tend to think you, you're absolutely... BDS, the BDS movement, which is spiritually a, 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 an arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, I think, which seeks the ultimate removal of the Jewish presence, the Jewish independent presence in Palestine, um, I think they want to create that siege mentality. You know, this is, this is, about, this is about driving Israelis back into the bunker, um, excoriating them, stigmatizing them so that they feel like there's no place to go, where there's no one who loves them, there's no one who supports them. Um, I, I tend to think that love will get you more out of the Israelis than hate. I mean, anybody who actually studies the you know, Jewish psyche over the last 2,000 years understands the traumas of history, will understand that. And so I hope, obviously, that if it's, let's say, a Hillary Clinton, uh, I think she understands this, that you know, it's, it's uh, the mistake in the early part of the Obama administration um, was to stand behind Israel and push. Um, I think Hillary's approach would be, for instance, um, to take Israel's hand and say, here's the cliff. You have to jump off this cliff, but I'm going to jump with you. That's a, that's a big difference. And I think Dennis is right about this, just on a practical level. When Palestinian leadership sees daylight or sees tension between Israelis and Americans, they can sit there and say, you know what, we're just going to wait for the Americans to do the pushing. We're not going to make any compromises. I happen to be more fatalistic than Dennis in thinking that it really doesn't matter what you do for the Palestinian movement. The Palestinian national movement has had five distinct opportunities to have a state over the last 70 years, and, and there's a reason that it doesn't, and that's because I don't think they actually want a partial solution to their problem. They want a utopian solution to their problem, which is the erasure of Israel, but again, I don't want to go down that pathway. So let's stay on BDS for just a second, because uh, there have been couple of public setbacks for BDS recently, but you're on the campus, you know, you talk about campus, you're out yeah. there. Well, what, you know, what's your view of what, what, what direction are we going in in the fight against BDS? You know, th there are setbacks, but the fact is, we, we were talking, BDS is not, a, not, a, not an expression that we even knew five or six right. years ago. Right. So it wins, it loses, but it exists. Mm -hmm. You know, and you basically now can't have a, a talk by an Israeli or a Jewish person about Israel that's not excoriating Israel on a campus without having, you, you saw what happened in Chicago last yeah. week at this big uh, LGBT convention, sure. which was you know, basically invaded by, by what I would call an anti-Semitic mob. Everybody, everybody know what Jeff is talking about because it's a fascinating story and, and uh, Rabbi Kleinbaum from the synagogue downtown has written about it. Can you say a word about it just quickly? Yeah, no, it was, a, it, was a, it was a convention, uh, one of the national political organizations for LGBT right. rights. Um, and they invited an Israeli NGO to come and speak about their work in Jerusalem. They run, I guess, sort of shelters for gay youth. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, they, they, do, they do coexistence work uh, to speak, and the BDS movement latched onto this. It's the, the sort of the, you know, this, and the, the, the irony and the, 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 the sort of morbid, you know, uh, kind of Baroque quality of it, of course, is that there's only one country in the Middle East where you have a gay pride parade. Uh, but the BDS movement has, uh, successfully hijacked part of the 
gay rights movement in America and has decided that, that, that gays must be for Palestinians, even though Palestinians are against gays. Um, and, and, and so they, what? And you know, yeah, and there's, they've invented this term pinkwashing, which uh, is supposed to uh, convey the idea that Israel is using its positive record on gay rights to mask what it does to the Palestinians. Um, I don't think when you tell the truth about what you do with gays, I don't think that's, that's propaganda, that's just telling the truth. So that's another story. Um, but anyway, so these things just, these things happen. There'll be victories and there'll be losses. But remember, this is a completely recent phenomenon where in academic associations, right, uh, people are voting to, to, to excoriate uh, and marginalize uh, Israelis. This didn't even happen five years ago. So they will have setbacks, they will have victories, but they exist now. In, in it's worth Googling that topic that uh, Jeff just spoke about, this, what happened in Chicago. It's, uh, it's, uh, it felt very sinister, and, um, and there's a lot written about well, it. Well, and, and the saddest part about it is that, so I, I, this is the broad theory about anti-Semitism. Like, the, the, the desire to scapegoat and hurt Jews is embedded in the DNA of Western civilization. We know that, and in Muslim civilization, right? And it manifests itself in some people in a kind of subconscious way. People are participating in this movement and they don't even understand what in their culture and what in the history of the West is forcing them into this. My problem with BDS is, starts with the, the double standard. If you want to be in an organization that, that demands uh, the boycott of 30 or 40 countries around the world for human rights abuses and one of those countries is Israel, fine. I might argue with you on the particulars, but, but when you are in a movement uh, given everything that's happening in the Middle East, which is that it's disintegrating into genocide, uh, when, when you decide that, that the, the, the occupation of the West Bank is the worst sin committed on Earth, um, I begin to question uh, whether you actually care about Palestinians or whether you're actually obsessed with Jews in a very negative way. Well put. Uh, David, uh, David, you had your hand up before? We have time for a couple more questions. There is a hard stop at 9.45. Here, there's, there's a question. Okay, so look. Why don't, who did I just call? Dave, David, let's get your question and then we'll, and Jeff, Jeff is here all day. All right. here all day. So to, to what extent do you think that the current Israeli government and AIPAC and others shoot themselves in the foot by this pro-Israel, anti-Israel label? I ask the question because I'm active at a Hillel, at a, college camp, at, at a Hillel, and there are many students on the campus, including leaders of the Hillel, including the media past president of the Hillel, who feels uncomfortable walking in the building because they feel like they are perceived as having to be uncritical of Israel when in fact they are. And they're uncritical of it. They're critical of Israel policy, I should say, critical of the right. settlements, whatever. And this pro-Israel makes people feel like, well, then you must be anti-Israel, and therefore you can't be part of the club. Is, can you comment on that? Well, I, I don't know the particulars of what, whatever campus this, this is. I, I mean, I think, Brown. It's brown, okay. Um, the, uh, which is a fairly typical campus in these, in these regards, I think, uh, in, in this way. Um, you know, we're, we're well past the, 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 the moment in history where you can convince an 18-year-old, 19-year-old, highly educated American Jew that Israel is perfect. Israel is perfect. You know, when I grew up and went to Hebrew school, it was, you know, this, this, this cartoon Israel that we were being so what happens, unfortunately, is that the caricature of Israel as this utopia, blameless utopia, uh, causes some kids, when they go into a campus in which the ambient kind of feeling is anti-Israel, it causes them to shed one simplistic narrative, what's called the Leon Uris narrative of Israel's founding and existence, um, and to, to adopt another equally simplistic narrative. Like Israel is neither completely good nor completely bad, but some people sort of switch over. And so there is a brittleness in the way that Israel is talked about um, in certain segments of the Jewish community that I think, you know, obviously the average 18, 19, 20 year old is oppositional anyway. He's trying to, he or she is trying to find a way in the world in which they're declaring independence from, from orthodoxies of various sorts. And so, and so if you present them a brittle perspective, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna work, and so I think there has to be a kind of um, suppleness and understanding. Look, I, so I believe in the Big Ten, and, and, and I've been a big, I don't agree with a lot of J Street's positions on, on issues, but they're in the tent, 
You know, and the tent to me is defined by, do you believe that the Jews have a right to a nation state of their own and at least part of their ancestral homeland? If you can, if you can check that box, then you're in the tent. You know, tents, tents do have flaps, I understand that. You know, the t a tent doesn't go on forever. And if you, if, you, if you are for the creation of a Palestinian state but against the existence of a Jewish state, well then you're outside my tent. But, but I think there has to be a lot more space given for this kind of, of dialogue. And I think, going back to the earlier answer, I think that, that proper, complicated education about how these issues came about, I think this is what's, what's important and will solve some of the problems that we have. We're, we're, we're you know, again, we're, this is America. America is the only place in, in the world where if you say something, uh, you know, where you say that's history, it means that's irrelevant. You know, um, we're talking about a, a country where it's very hard to convince people that, that events today have their roots in events from 70 years ago or 100 years ago or 3,000 years ago. Um, so I do believe that if we actually spent more time talking about why things are the way they are, a lot of people would probably come to a kind of sober middle. But again, like if, if I've been to those APAC conventions, and, and to me, and I'm about to insult anybody who's on the National Board of APAC, I apologize, they don't feel very Jewish in the following sense. It's too, I mean, the, the, one of the glories of Judaism is that you get to argue about what everything means all the time, right? And, and these, are, these, are, these are sort of classic political conventions in which, in which basic points are, are hammered home and, and there's no dissent and there's no, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a political convention. It's not, it's not what you would think of as a kind of very Jewish gathering where you argue your way toward some kind of consensus. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's deadly on a campus today. Okay, so we're, we're gonna wrap up, and I just wanna give- I'll, 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 you want me to just do that one? Yeah, we'll take that one. I'll, so I'll be, I'll, like I won't, I won't, out the I won't, I won't right. use a lot of words this time. <laughs> Thank you. Ask it as a yes or no question. Yeah, sorry, I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, you've, you've said some interesting things about the key players, at least today, in the area. You talked about Netanyahu having a hunker down personality, Obama saying, take risks. Maybe Israel has greater consequences of those risks. Um, and the Palestinians turning down at least five opportunities for a state. Given that, what should Israel do? Oh, so like a short question. <laughs> uh, Thank you. We'll be yeah. Here. No, 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 no. I think I, I think I answered. I think I partially answered it. I think that 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 again, Israel has to seize back the narrative. And Israel that is perceived as, as wanting peace and compromise is an Israel that's much more popular in the world and therefore much more effective in the world. And so I think that the, 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 if there's one thing that you have to do is that you have to tell the settlers, look, you're actually hurting the cause of the Jewish state and we have to stop what you're doing, especially in the far reaches of the West Bank. And we have to show, we have to sh show Israelis and we have to show American Jews and show everybody else that we're gonna reverse this, we're gonna create conditions on the ground in which a Palestinian state could one day emerge. I think that would, that would leapfrog over some of the negative narrative that's, that's now in the system. Okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take the prerogative. What was I gonna, I'm gonna give you a minute to just uh, articulate something you started um, when you mentioned Leon Uris and Exodus, and, um, because we're, we're roughly the same age, and I grew up thinking Exodus was just, you know, I mean, it's like the greatest movie ever. I showed it to, uh, and, and Cordes has written about this, I showed it to a group of seventh graders, I'd say like five years ago, and it was a yawn. I mean, and forget the fact that the movie's made differently, you know, the way movies Could have cut an hour out of it. Exactly. Yeah. But um, I think you're right. I think that that narrative no, no longer either speaks or, or for kids or younger generations is, is aware enough so what, what might be that narrative that, you know, for the Hillel kids, I mean, you started to articulate it, and, and you don't have to go into great detail about it, because as I said, the Cantors want the, the Beamer right now, but, right. but what, what, what is that narrative? If it's not the perfect Israel, uh, what, 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 what can, because what can, we've even seen shifts in how advocacy organizations are dealing with Israel now. Okay. Right? So, so the, the, the 30 second on one foot answer is that, is that Israel is not the, the root of what we have to do. It, the way people, especially 20 year olds, 25 year olds, perceive Israel has more to do with how they understand their own Jewishness than, than the politics of the moment. I, I think that one of, one of the deformities in American Judaism is that we overemphasize Israel as part of our identity. 
I mean, I'm going to talk about this later, and it's a very important thing, and we have, you know, Israel's done wonders for the American Jewish community in a lot of different ways, but we overemphasize this, and I, I, think, I think we have to reverse engineer this. You know, if you feel Jewish, if you feel connected to this people in a, a cross-border, global way, if you are interested in Jewish text, if you speak a Jewish language, if you, if you have a connection, then, then, then Israel will, then love of Israel and an interest in Israel is derivative of this. I mean, it's where it's all from, so why wouldn't you? If you spoke Hebrew, you would naturally be more interested in what's going on in Israel. And so I think we have it all backward. That's why I, 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 I kind of make a, a thing about this APEC convention. One of the things that makes me sad about it is that it's the largest Jewish gathering in the country, and it's a political convention. I mean, you know, you know, there's, there are no shortcuts in Judaism, and we've tried to build this shortcut, Israel advocacy as an expression of Jewishness, but if you don't have the, the, the feeling that I'm part of an eternal people with a, with a unique message for the world and a set of texts and a language and a literature and a civilization, um, then, it's, then, then, then if you're a 21st century American in a detribalized, de-ethnicized America, uh, where you're so distant from the Holocaust, where you're so distant from from, even the founding founding of the state. from the founding of the state, and all you see is a narrative imposed on it, a civil rights narrative, in which you're on the wrong side of that civil rights narrative, then, then, then of course you're going to lose. So it, it starts with Judaism. It doesn't start with Israel. So my request is that you write that article so I can give that sermon, all right? And then we'll, we'll be all right. good. Thank you, Jeff, very much. All right. Uh, thank you for, uh, for being here early. Thank you ever for joining us and uh, for, for questions. We'll hear more from Jeff at uh, 11.30. Uh, services start promptly at 10 a.m. And uh, as I said, Jeff will be speaking at 11.30, then dialogue. I actually probably have a couple announcements I have to make. So if you just bear with me for a second. Uh, yes, uh, services begin at 10. And, uh, and at 11.30, Jeff will be speaking two ships in the night. Are we really one people? And I assume that he'll come back to some of the uh, some of the issues that we brought up this morning. Thank you, everybody. Shabbat shalom. We'll see you throughout the morning. <laughs>